have a kind of session show today. I have a, a couple of special guests with me today. I have Mr. Matt Robinson, who's on my left. I have his campaign manager, Mr. Chris Reyes. And we're kind of international here. As I told them before the show started, I warned them that I say what I say what I want to say. You know, I'm still I'm still I'm still the revolutionary Republican as always. You guys know that. And I'm gonna lead off my, my old saying, my show is, is about right talk because hopefully right talk can lead to right thinking and lead to right action and we'll end up doing the right thing. I'm on the right, I'm a conservative. And my wife hates me to say it, but I'm a Republican. And I don't care what you say or what you think, but that's it, that's what the deal is. We wanna talk about the election, the upcoming school board election in Pflugerville for part of as much as much as sure as I can. And then I have a special guest Something that just came up yesterday, it just dropped, kind of dropped in my lap, and I'm glad it dropped in my lap. And I hope that, that Matt will be understanding toward letting someone else have, have, have some time about something that is a significant public interest here in, in Austin. So let's talk about sc school board. Let's talk about school board. Uh, so I'm running for uh, Place 6, Pflugerville ISD. What area does that cover, Place 6? That covers right on the other side of, well, so Place 6, there are seven places in the uh, Board of Trustees, Pflugerville. And none of them are designated as one particular area. They're all okay. the whole district at large. Um, one of the things that I want to institute if I get elected is single member representation uh -huh. and, and break it down into districts. We could, you know, uh, put it with each representative being representative from their high school area. Or if, uh, you know, have six representatives that are elected by the middle school area, mm -hmm. then have one member at large. But I think if you get too many board members coming from the same area, the same neighborhood, then you collectively don't have the concerns of your whole district right. in mind. Okay. Tell me this. How many people are on the school board? Seven? There's seven board of trustee members. And about how much do they have in the budget to spend? All the money that the feds don't get La or take? Last year, their budget was $201 million which is about uh, between three and four times the amount the uh, city of Pflugerville gets. Wow. So the school board spends more money than the city. Absolutely. So that's a very important spot. And uh, tell us about yourself and your background. Uh, my name is Matt Robertson. I'm from Wisconsin. Mike Lee, man. Nice to meet nice you for you. the second time. <laughs> Third time, maybe. Third time? Third time. Well, that's right. At, 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 the, at the restaurant, at the... And then today. Yep. Uh, I'm from Wisconsin. Uh, grew up just south of Milwaukee. Played football. Did not play hockey, even though I'm from up north. Love the Green Bay Packers. Uh, joined the Army when I was 19, I think. I uh, went to basic training at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which is an artillery uh, base. So they put me in an artillery unit. I was a medic. I was hoping to get stationed in the hospital, air conditioning. No such luck. I was out in the field with uh, all the artillery men with the Paladins. We're in 4th 42nd Field Artillery. And so I met my wife. She's from Buda. Her family's from Buda. And I've been in Texas ever since. It's okay to come to Texas, man. Texas is a nice place to come. It, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. It's a little warm sometimes, but I, I'm, I'm used to it now. And they tell me that I had the qualification to go to Harvard Law School, but I didn't want to deal with any more snow, so I went to SMU. Which you, don't I like I was you, you, you don't miss the snow just a little bit? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I, I miss the snow. That's for bears that you have hair on their behinds and stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, let's see, Chris is your campaign chairman, right? Chris is my campaign Treas manager. Is treasurer. He, uh, He's campaign manager, but when you're running a local race, it's, it's not that large of an apparatus. I would say I'm more of a... Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll accept the title as campaign manager, but I'm more of a friend and, and supporter. And um, I think what you'll find with, with Matt is that um, when you're a friend, you're a friend. And I mm -hmm. think that that's where he got a lot of his votes last year was the fact that when people know Matt, he does treat you like a friend. Um, <coughs> I think all the gentlemen that are running are stand-up individuals. And I uh -huh. think that when you put your neck out and, and you run uh, to make decisions for, for a large uh, population like the school district and it affects our children I think that that's admirable um, when it comes down to the ideas mm -hmm. I think that uh, Matt Robertson wins that you know day and night and uh, I, I hope that with the time we have here he gets to talk about those ideas because I, I think people should know what the ideas are um, I think we should get back to that in politics I think we should get back to civilly 
uh, discoursing, and I think that you should be able to agree to disagree and it not be an abnormality. I have a uh, extreme admiration for people who involve. I really do. I call them like running people, you know? Like, you know Gabriel Needler? I think I mentioned to Gabe, right? Yeah, yes, sir. I, Gabe. I just called Gabriel Needler. And he took it in the, in the, in, in the, in the fashion. I, mean, I should call him Chief Running Gabe. <laughs> you know, because he was running. And really, the only reason I really got involved uh, trying to do this type of outreach was because Gabe decided to run. And Pokey has a show that I started out helping out on. And I thought I figured he'd need some help. And, and now we ended up right here. So, uh, what, what do you think is the most important issue out there in Fluvia for the people? I think one of the most important issues, I mean, there's a few of them. Um, I think one of the most important issues is making sure we don't get too excited about our new growth and forget about all the schools that have established us and got us to where we are. Um, you know, with 21 elementary schools, uh, a lot of those schools are 20, 20 years old and older. Mm -hmm. And they're in need of more maintenance and more care. Things are breaking down more. And we can't be so focused on all the new growth we're getting. I mean, just in Pflugerville last year, we added 4,400 apartment units, over 4,400 apartment units, and over 1,100 houses. So the growth is very exciting, and all that's coming out to the east, new high schools, new elementary schools. And it's very easy to get caught up in that and not forget, and forget about our older schools uh, where the majority of our population is still at. So a lot of money is being spent in maintenance and things like that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you need facilities upgrades and things like that? Well, Timmerman Elementary just got a brand new school. That was part of the bond issue, so they are right next to the brand new stadium. But um, just make sure, making sure we're, uh, all the uh, security, security measures got updated at the elementary schools. Uh, some of those things aren't working though. You know, all the roofs just got redone. Uh, some of those are still leaking. You know, so we need to make sure we're holding our vendors accountable when we're paying millions of dollars for these things that they're actually gonna last 10 or 15 years the way they're supposed to. Now I have a good friend, uh Ken, Kenneth Thompson from, uh, he has a host of radio show, KZI. Did you, did you meet him or speak with him? Did I, I did. I'm, I spoke with him through email. He used to be president of the school board. And uh, I thought that it might be good for you to meet him because he could tell you some of the challenge, types of challenges that you had to face. Did you get to talk about that with him? I did not. I you mean, just, just briefly we talked. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, do you have any thoughts or opinions? Or perspectives on student retention and, and uh, growth and safe school zones? Uh, a lot of issues are coming up now with the voucher system. Uh, a lot of parents are concerned with, uh, well, a lot of the school district is concerned uh, that the voucher system is going to take money away from the district. And it is uh, when the students have the option or the right to go to any school they choose to, um, they're going to they're gonna go where the best education is. Uh, so the voucher system, as far as going to a charter school or a uh, private school, they can take the money that the district would be getting from the state and fund that to the charter school where the child is going. So that's going to take millions of dollars out of the district's pocket. So the uh, shakeup from that initially is going to be huge. We, we have it slightly better in Pflugerville because with the continued increase in growth, uh, you know, last year we had a 12% windfall in income just by all those new residents coming into Pflugerville. You know, we're expecting an increase of 3,300 students in the next four years. Um, so you're still going to get an increase in money, and, and so it won't be such a shock to lose that money to private schools. Uh, I think what we need to look at, though, is why are these children choosing to go? Why are their parents taking them to a private school? that they have to pay for that's further away. What's wrong with the public <coughs> school where they're at? Let's, let's fix the problem at the school so that way they don't choose to go to a different school. You know, Matt and Chris, there was a time when I worked as a substitute teacher in Houston Independent School District in the Alternative District. It's a large school district. And uh, yeah, I worked in a school called, uh, it was uh, Contemporary, Lear 
CLC, Contemporary Learning Center, in HISD was known as, as Criminal's Last Chance. Hmm. We had the students that basically were kicked out of their main schools and they went to that school and they could like make up grades and things like that, make up the years they were behind. And I see the problem in schools as, it's, it's kind of an oversimplification, but it seems to be that some folks think that, think that you can solve everything by throwing money at it. I just don't believe that. Having been in a, court, in a classroom with the best of the best or the worst of the worst, however you want to look at it, it seems to me that the most important thing was discipline and order and structure. And to that, I, I'd like to add something that I've said often on my show and it shocked the daylights out of me, actually. But last year sometime, I read a book by Douglas Wilder, who was the first elected black governor in Virginia. Mm -hmm. In this book, he wrote that black people, African Americans, were better read in 1880 than they are today. And I can't, it's hard for me to just wrap my mind around that. And I see literacy as, as, as that, that, means, that means they're more literate in 1880 than 100. It, it, uh, over a hundred years ago than, than now. And that's sad, and, that's, and it, to me that's wrong and that's criminal. I look at, I look at a, a good, solid education as a civil right. I think it's the last civil rights, really the last civil right that's needed. Because education is key, everyone agrees with that. Absolutely. But, it does, but, it does, but what, what, what it takes to make it work effectively doesn't seem to be on anyone's mind. Well, I, I saw this saying the other day, and it said, <clears throat> Teachers don't do what they do for the income. They do it for the outcome. The good ones do. And, and there's a lot of good ones out there. My wife's a teacher. And um, you say, you know, you can't throw money at it. Um, and, and I agree, you know, to, to an extent. You know, I, I think our teachers are not necessarily their salary, but if you ask them about their benefits, you know, you mm -hmm. could probably have an hour long show with the teacher <laughs> on their benefits. Um, but I think that's sad that. that you talk about the system because it's it's, this, it's a system. It's a systemic issue, you know. Um, kids getting caught up in the system, and um, I think Matt, if you could kind of highlight what some of your thoughts are as far as kind of rewarding teachers and, and kind of changing the culture so that we can, you know, foster this atmosphere for teachers. Because teachers, man, they're really on the front line, and they're the ones doing the the, the good work. I I really don't think the the problem lies with the teachers. I think the problem lies with the uh, at home because we I, I think we need to have some kind of parent resource center in place um, you know I, I'm not always gonna say everything everybody agrees with mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm gonna say what I believe to be the truth <coughs> and I'm always gonna speak honestly you know we never want to say that we can improve as a person or as a parent but the truth of the matter is is that in some in a lot of areas we can we can be better people constantly. We can be better parents. Um, we need to make sure accountability is being taken all, all through the board, you know, starting with the parents. Uh, parents need to be accountable for that discipline and respect. Um, I was raised, a, a story about my mom. My mom was a single mom uh, from the time I was, I think I was two, maybe one or two o'clock, or I'm one or two years old. But I think I was a sophomore or junior, and we lived out in the country in Wisconsin. And I came home drunk one time, and uh, she was up waiting for me, and she put me in the car and drove me 45 minutes to the police station. <laughs> and she said, go turn yourself in. And I walked inside the police station, and I said, I've been drinking. Uh, I'm here to turn myself in for underage drinking. And they put handcuffs on me and uh, took them off, and then said, all right, you did your time, and laughed and, kinda, <laughs> and said, don't do it again. Uh, and I went out into the car and told my mom what happened, and she had intended that to be my punishment. She went inside and she wanted, she wanted them to keep me overnight. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, you know, because that's the kind of the discipline she tried to instill. You know, she, she didn't take any disrespect. Um, I wasn't allowed to disrespect other people. I wasn't allowed to treat any other person uh, any way that I didn't want to be treated. And, and she held me to that standard. And so I think we, if we have some kind of parent resource center in place where parents have uh, outreach to go somewhere to get help if they need it, um, you know, there's tons of stresses at home, jobs, family, uh, you know, if they have some kind of, 
I, I mean, we, we need to brainstorm on, on ideas. But the old Timmerman School is now being converted into office offices. That'd be a great place for a, a parent resource center to come together with uh, some parent volunteers to manage the database and stuff like that. Any issues that come up that parents have, we go to that resource center and it gets logged in and then every time it comes up again, there's the solution for it. And we're building better households and, and that keeps the parents accountable. And then the teachers need to be accountable by doing what they love to do. They, they, you're right, they, they become teachers to teach for life so they can have that effect on the child, so they can mm -hmm. have that outcome, so they can make presidents and doctors and all kinds of things. Um, they, they need to, you know, we need to support them in why they're there, you know, whether that comes with giving better health benefits, giving um, more time for themselves, uh, having, uh, you know, a 10% discount day with the businesses in Pflugerville, you know, on Tuesday. Uh, that increases the, the community strength and the teacher strength. You know, I, I, you touched on a couple of things that, again, I Sorry, forget. I, 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 read, I, I just read a bunch of stuff, and, uh, and I have a, a few thoughts of my own about some things. It seems now we have, at one time in this country, we had separate but, separate, separate but unequal realities between based on race. Now it's like we have... Uh, unequal families. You know, I look, I look at the quote, typically minority neighborhoods, usually um, a non-nuclear family. And that wasn't true in the, in the 1940s. And so when you talk about the family structure and, and talking about putting in things in place to try to support the people who, who, who are closest to the children, to me, that's very important. They were talking about that on the other, on, on, trade, on the trailer park show tonight about there's something LULAC is doing to have a kind of think tank to, to, to try to kind of develop a support system to, to help inspire kids to want more. And, and the other thing that, that, that sticks in my mind often, and I get this from my baby brother with a PhD in philosophy and adult, and adult education, he says that most, in too many cases, African American men don't get the structure that they need until they get to jail, to prison. Now, I couldn't tell you how many guys I know who went to jail, learned to play chess, went to jail, came out preachers, went to jail, became readers. I have a brother who uh, has a challenged background, as I've been say, politically correct to be told to say. I say he's a criminal, but you know, you got to ruin this feel good stuff. I think that's bad for kids too, because kids think they're supposed to feel good all the time. Absolutely. Life is not easy, this is no picnic. If the good book said, in the face of thy face shall thou eat bread, that doesn't sound like somebody going to a picnic. That sounds like somebody putting in some work, in, in some sun, sweating. But we, 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 we become kind of soft, you know, soft and, and weak and lame because we haven't, we, we're not instilling grit and fight and hunger in people. And that comes from a disciplined situation many times, most times, most usually. When I was growing up, it came from the family unit. But now, since we have all this government intervention, these uh, new ideas about families and crap, we, uh, I guess we have to find alternative ways of being able to structure things to give kids the best chance. Because to me, when you're running for school board, you're running for the mind, minds and hearts of the children, of the future. That's who it is. How did you guys meet anyway? I don't know that. We're just, we're, just just friend, we're, we're friends from a while back. Um, I used to work in an elementary school, and he was board president of the PTO. And my school, and my then, kids went to school his, at the elementary school. His kids school. went there, so oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's how we met. We kind of just... Where are you from? I'm from Pflugerville. Pflugerville? Yeah, I went to, th from middle school on, I went, went you know, to Pflugerville. I'm a product of PFISD. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Went to school in Austin, Walnut Creek Elementary. Oh, yeah. Uh, a shout out to the Walnut Creek Eagles. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, but, I, I mean, I, I'm going to say a shout out because I, there's a gym I went to for the first time for the first time the other day, real good, called Lifetime. There's a guy named Mike Steed who works there. Yeah, told, my wife told him I'd give him a shout out on the show to be watch, watch the show. I hope he got his popcorn. He said he was going to have his popcorn. He watching. Don't drink the soda though. The soda will put weight on you. It's not a good thing. <laughs> I know that. I went so to. Our, is this your first shout out, or, or do you know? Yes, yeah, this is the first time I've ever done it. You got to do shout outs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> People like to shout out. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> How about a shout out for uh, term limits? You know, I know that's oh, what we yeah. were talking oh. about before segment, and that's kind of something. Oh, that yeah, they have term limits in Pflugerville? They do not have term limits in Pflugerville. We have a couple board members that have been on there uh, uh, going on 16 plus years, and, uh, you know, outstanding people. Uh, Miss Vernon Jean Mott is one of those people. She's given her heart and soul to Pflugerville and the district. That, that's who I ran against last year. Um, but when they've been on, when, when the board members have been on there too long, they, they keep doing the same things. You know, they, they don't change. Uh, Pflugerville's changed. You know, Pflugerville isn't a small town anymore, and they have to, we need to start thinking in not quite the uh, small town capacity. Um, you know, with I-35 and the toll road on each side of us, we're minutes away from the capital of Texas, Austin. We're minutes away from the airport. Everything is up and coming. We've got a water park. We're getting a hospital. Pflugerville is a hot place to live, you know. Uh, with all the increase in, in population, um, you know, we have everything we need right there almost. And if we don't, we can just drive half an hour to an hour to find it. Um, so we need to have, we need to quit having the small town mentality. Even though we have the heart of a small, quaint little town, uh, the population is growing too big to have that. You're, you're not a cow town anymore. Right. Well, you can't forget your folks west of I-35 that are in the Pflugerville. Absolutely, too. that are in Austin. And so we have to have new ideas. We have to have fresh ideas. We have to, we can't keep doing the same thing that's worked every year. You know, I mean, you can't come in with the same script every show and just keep doing the same thing, you gotta keep it fresh and new. That way you get fresh new audience members, right? Only, only my slogan, <laughs> I use that every time because I happen to think it's true and it's one of my, one of my goals is to, is to enlighten people and to, to the extent that I'm able and give them a different way of looking at things, a different perspective on things because life is learning to me. And, and the one thing in life, in life that seems to be certain is change. Um, so the district's grown a whole lot, huh? The district has grown. Is that, is it, is that growth because of uh, the uh, sort of exodus from Austin because of taxes and things like that? I don't think so, because our taxes, our property taxes this past year just went up quite a bit. Um, they went up about uh, between 8 and 18 uh, percent per, per house. Jeez. And so it was, it was quite a huge jump. Um, a lot of people are kind of shocked that just got their property taxes a couple weeks ago and the school is the main taxing entity and the uh, if they spend more money in the city of course yeah the, the debt relief tax is maxed out at 50 cents you know if elected I want to put you know a three to five year plan in place to reduce that tax and a lot of people say we need to give the teachers raises we need to lower the taxes we need to save money how are they going to do it they don't tell you how they're going to do it. They tell you your ideas. I want to go line by line through the budget. I want to reduce things like consulting fees that are, we're spending a couple million dollars on. Um, Lawyer's fees. Well, we also need to look at finding new avenues of revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got that gorgeous, you know, what, $27 million stadium that we just built. What about hosting like a concert series right there in mm -hmm. Pflugerville? Or having the Texas Longhorns have a practice there? You know, I mean, it, it's a just right down the road for them. Come, hey, come practice at our brand new stadium and christen it for us. So you need some outside the box thinking that, that focuses on solutions, not just problems. Right. Okay. Now I'm gonna have to ask your forgiveness somewhat, Matt, because I was thinking of the whole show with you. And uh, if there's a final pitch you'd like to make to, to people who are kind enough to watch, I'd like to hear it because I have a, a family outside who's a family of a of, of I have Clurin Williams. He's a he's I think he's the brother of the young Austinite that, that got shot yes just recently the most Absolutely. recent shooting. Uh, definitely, and it's a very somber issue. So I'm happy to share my time and thank you for having us. Um, I, I'm not always we're not always going to agree. You know, I'm not always going to make decisions that you agree with. I'm not always going to say the right thing. I'm, I'm not a politician. Um, I don't have any ego or aspirations or personal agenda beyond getting on the school board and helping the kids and creating a stronger education for them. Um, 
everything I do, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the truth. And everything I say, you're going to know why I'm choosing to do it and where I'm coming from. it. And we absolutely can have discussions about it. And I want to hear different angles and different ideas from all the issues. And I believe that I'm the candidate that's going to take all that information and listen and care enough to change something for the better of the entire community. I'm going to listen to everybody. I'm going to process all the information. I'm going to make the best decision for the children. What is most challenging about uh, helping Chris from your perspective, Chris? Helping Matt, Matt. from your perspective, Chris? <laughs> um, it's, it's really not a challenge. It's, it's an honor to help a friend, and it's an honor to, to help someone who cares about kids. Probably image. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Since we're going there, you know. Well, Maybe say it. You know, I asked that because back in 1982, I worked in a on a congressional campaign with a guy named Bill Oliver, who was, he was running a congressman in Mickey, Mickey Leland's campaign, the 18th district in, in Houston. And uh, working that working as deputy with Bill, I had to run all over the place in Houston. And there was a lady that was working on the camp on a. I think she was connected to Ben Reyes. And I was kind of like an unknown factor, so no one knew who I was, so I could go in different camps and without arousing too much suspicion. Yeah. Named Lupita, she used to drive, and that was when I first ran, first ran to a breakfast taco. <laughs> I, and I never had a tortilla that early in the morning with eggs and all that stuff. <laughs> but when, you, when you're working in the campaign, you gotta move. You lost weight? <laughs> I'm trying to. It's you know, no, it's, got, it's, no, it's, it's, it's yeah, a yeah, good yeah, way yeah. to keep trim, for yeah. real. You know, I again, it's not as large of an apparatus as like maybe running a, a congressman or, or a presidential campaign. And no, I, I think some of those guys actually gain weight. As late as they mm -hmm. eat, because they they work all day and they eat late and they it's eat all the bad it's stuff. It's because they're eating too good. <clears throat> well, I will minutes. say this about him though: that that sports coat is, is you know, he, he can thank <laughs> me for that. I, I got his image right. You know, <laughs> I, I got him dressing up and wearing a tie, and you know, so. Yeah. Who, Matt? Yeah, Matt, yeah, yeah. I hadn't seen Matt in a tie yet, yeah. and I've seen him three times. Just on Tuesday, last Tuesday I was wearing <laughs> a tie. Last Tuesday you had a tie on? <laughs> uh, this Wednesday I'll have a tie on, too. You have a tie on? I, I do have a tie. You did make comment about my tie, but I'm going home with my tie, I Matt. love that tie. That's a nice tie. Hmm. Man, a little gold line in there, too. <laughs> Mike, I bet you dress. I bet your PJs are, are sharp, man. I bet no, you. <laughs> man. You probably got I'm the silk flannel PJ. <laughs> okay, I um, I understand my other guests are just about here. I wish, I hope they come on in. They just come on in, come on on the set. Okay. And uh, I want to thank you guys for coming. Thank you. The pleasure was mine. And after you win, I hope you'll come back and talk to me. Absolutely. We'll talk about what we're going to do. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Okay, I got my other guests coming in, uh, Mr. Clurin Clur Williams, and this is, is this, this is not your mom, this has got to be your sister. Are you the one who was praying yesterday? Yes. Okay. Cool. Good to see you guys. Something. Good to see you guys. Thanks, Matt. Good luck, man. Right there, Mr. Lee. Thank you. Okay. Hey, how you doing? How you doing I'm sir? Mike Lee. I'm Mike Lee. This, nice to meet you. This is the praying lady right here. I went to Gibbons Park yesterday. I, I didn't know it was coming. I didn't know this was going to happen. I um, I don't even know if you saw me. Probably didn't see me. No. I had I had on a Frederick Douglass. Uh, I'm a Black Republican T-shirt. Okay. I didn't get in the fight. It's good. You're not in Gibbons Park with that black Republican t-shirt. I, I ain't scared. I, you, you, I know you're not wearing that t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this is Clorin Williams? Clorin Williams. Clorin Williams. Clorin Williams. And your brother's name is? Lawrence Parrish. And he was a, a shooting victim of, of the Austin Police? Of the Austin Police. When, when did that happen? Uh, I April heard about 7th. it. April 7th? April 7th. That's been about, that's, that's, that's been too long. My, my, my. My, my sympathies go out to your family. I've uh, 
I kind of have an acquaintance with tragedy lately. My best buddy of 59 years passed away August 2nd. He was buried August 13th. And my mom passed away on November 9th, about the time Trump was being announced the winner. Sorry, so, I'm, I'm, you know. so tell us what happened. Tell us what happened. I hope I don't want to get you in any trouble. I know you have a lawyer. I know your lawyer's probably going. The lawyer's probably going to be mad that you even don't that you're even talking. I just want to know what happened. Uh, right now, uh, we have a, a turn of events has occurred. <clears throat> the first report, initial report, of my brother had fired uh, at law enforcement. Fired at them? Fired at them. But they I actually say, uh, said that he exchanged fire with the law enforcement. And um, then they came out and reported that he never fired a weapon at them. Did he even have one? I don't I, believe he had not, one. I heard there was one in the house somewhere, but at the moment, we still haven't got enough information or evidence to say he had a weapon. We just know that they found one. They found one? Um, how many people live in that house, and where is it? The house he, uh, uh, this, uh, this happened at, it was a uh, Cavalier Park. He uh, had a longtime girlfriend and uh, some siblings, her children there. His children didn't actually stay in the home. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to give or take probably about eight or nine people there. Okay. That live there? They live in the house. And as best, you, as best you know, as best you can recall, what, ha what exactly happened? Uh, what I recall is I, I remember speaking to my brother earlier that day, uh, that evening, um, before he was shot and gone down. Um, might like to add that, uh, my brother was shot in the back nine times. Nine times? Yes. They initially said that he was shot four times and tried to downplay it and say that he didn't have any life-threatening wounds. Uh, I'm not a doctor, but I, I know people, uh, myself personally, that mm -hmm. have been shot in the leg and have passed away. So for you to say that he's been shot nine times and he's all good. What are you implying? Are you implying the same diagnosis that you had on a black woman that she didn't feel pain before y'all uh, integrated us? Are that, is that what you're implying? Are you saying that my people don't feel pain, that we so strong, our feet so big, our hands so big, our lips and our nose so big that you can shoot a gun, you can shoot any type of gun, and we'll still be okay? Now, I heard some, some some things when I was out at the park, at Givens Park yesterday. Was was the shooting like through a door or something like that? What, what, how, uh, how, how did it happen? They initially sh uh, a shot at him. Uh, they the story was they gave us was that he was in front of his doorway at his home, and he shot at the Austin Police Department. And then Austin Police Department returned fire. Uh, when I actually went to the home myself. Uh, I did a little uh, suspecting, you know, I looked around, uh, did a little bit of my own snooping around, and I seen a lot of bullets going through the front door. Uh, for now, those you bullets, got pictures and stuff like that? I have some pictures, I have some footage also, um, and uh, I'll share it with you, I'll get it to mm -hmm. you. I don't know if we can get it today, but uh, I sure will get it to you. And is there a written report, or are they working on it? We have different reporters. Uh, I have different reporters that I've been speaking with. Okay. Uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're utilizing the resources that we have right now at the moment in this city to get this story out there. Now I want to give a, a big thanks to uh, Clifford Gillard and uh, Robert Muhammad. That's how I found out about the thing at Guinness Park yesterday. Yes, sir. Robert put something up on Facebook. I think my wife caught, caught track of it. And I had planned to have the school board candidate on the whole time. And then when I was out there, when I was out at Givens Park, Clifford mentioned me, he said, man, you want to meet your family or something? I said, well, he said, can you get them on the show tomorrow? I said, my show's already in place. I have shows in place up to May, through May. And I said, but maybe. And I went home. And I was on the drive home from Gibbons Park. And as you see at that prairie messing with people, uh, you know, I thought to myself, you know, 
but you gotta take what the good Lord gives you, you know? And I was kind of like there because I think it's important for conservatives such as myself to indicate that they give a damn about people. You got to. And that's why I'm, and I, I, I'm mad at Austin. I'm, oh, I want to do a series on Austin about what's wrong up in this piece. Because oh, yeah. all these so-called good Democrats and I see all this stuff happening to black people and it's just not right. It ain't right. Yeah. And on my card I say, right talk leads to right thinking, do the right action and do the right thing. Yes, and I also say all the time, and this is my stock saying, Rob Muhammad, he, oh, he's one of, he's one of them, he's, I'm just a guy. He, he, he says that to himself sometimes. I say, what's good for the black community is good for the community, and I'm going to say it until I'm proven wrong. Because if the community is out of balance, if one is raised up, the, the whole community is better off. That's just how I see it. I try to keep things simple for me. You know, my mind is not, not you know, well, we it's not all that. We all live in a city that is growing rapidly. Uh, not to mention, this is the most segregated city in the United States. Of but it's liberal. And they even like us. I mean, like yeah, them. This is they a place just, where we get uh, coerced. And a lot of things that happens here, they like to throw in the rug. They yeah, want to hurry up. And they don't want you to know that it is a such thing as a crime right here. That's what made me send that text. After I left, after I left Kevin Spark yesterday, after you prayed, I started rethinking things. I said, you know, and I, Clifford said something to me, but I had to go. Cause I want to get me something to eat, and uh, I, and I on the ride, somewhere between getting spark and the ride home, I thought I sent a text to Clifford, Robert, Clifford and Robert. I say maybe I can swing, I can swing something, try to swing something. This needs to be done, Lord. What you doing to me? But that's that's just what came. And your name is Fatima. Man. Fatima is your fault. <laughs> it was a uh, no. It was, Cl it was Clifford, Robert, and uh. It wasn't my fault. No, he, Clifford, Robert, and uh. Chaz. Because mm -hmm. I kind, I kind, I said I used to be on the uh, commissioner on the African American Quality of Life Commission. Oh. And that's how I kind of come in contact with these people, and I, I kind of come in contact with with Chaz because you have Austin's Jones, Austin's. Justice Coalition meeting. Co-founded that, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, although I'm conservative, and my wife hates when they say I'm Republican, but I am. You are what you are. And I don't give a damn. I but some cool but black I know you, 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 that just keep real. I know. But what I was about to say was Rob Muhammad. I said it was good for the black community, good for the community. Rob Muhammad said it's good for the community, it's good for the black community, it's good for the community, and it's good for America, and it's good for the world. He just goes. All, he, goes, he goes, he takes it which across the goal line. He takes it across the goal line. Which is true. But my thing is to make things better for everybody. And that's one message that my brother had. I talked to him today, actually, before I came into the station. And he wanted me to let everybody know, in spite of his injuries and his pain, in spite of the dampness he has in his heart and his soul, in spite of the agony that his children is going through and the family is going through, he want everybody to remember that's about love, it's about unity, it's about supporting one another. We ain't out here to put no big hate protests and say we right. hate the law. I'm, I'm, I, was, I was really encouraged that nobody took to the streets. I said, hmm, this is, it's a, Robert and I put something up and I said, hmm, this is, all right, we don't have no, no urban league, NAACP, we watch them down the street making noise, and we have vaginas on the head, crazy, crazy. Well, you know, you know they, uh, actually game and thought, engaged in thoughtful action rather than reaction. A lot of people say, well, hey, uh, they call me Jinx out there, too, you know. Well, they street, say, street name street Jinx? Street name Jinx, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm a musician. Okay, so uh, when I wear my T-shirt, I say, man, Jinx, Jinx, Jinx got my back. <laughs> and, that, and that's going to mean something because <laughs> okay. we've been out here in the community and we were making sure that we made it our business to be known and, and let people know that we are here to do that, to support and to give uh, acknowledgement into areas that uh, usually don't get the spotlight. Now, what I really, when I was really on, on the way here to the station, I was saying, I sure hope the, the black churches are, are trying to help this family. And you know, uh, I hope. I mean, I, 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 I had a, I literally got out. Uh, 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 got out there 
and I made some statements about the black churches and, uh, uh, and the history and the, the actual responsibilities that I feel they are obligated to give to the community for being so. And those things I spoke on, and uh, they didn't like what I said, uh, you know. And, uh, and I said, it's been a plague not only in the black church, but that whole sentence started in the household. And now mm -hmm. that we're, 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 we're old enough to know the difference, I can honestly say there's a separation in church and family mm -hmm. in the black household where you will have some of the family that do go to church not really mess with the other side of the family if they didn't go to church. Yeah. And you see that in our community, it plagues our community because this is another part of the division that we have to speak on. This is another part of the division and the ignorance that we slept on too long. We even mm -hmm. allow religion and all kind of traditions to divide us right up on our nose. Now you mentioned something that I had mentioned on the, pre on the previous segment was um, we have a long time ago when I was growing up, there was segregation. And you had separate but unequal realities, really, in education, in everything. Everything was separate. Now we have, we have unequal families. You know, many, many, many African American families are challenged in terms of their structure. Yes. And this puts our young men, particularly, and our community in general, in a not so good situation. Yeah. Because guys, and I've taught in. Uh, I used to substitute teaching HISD, right? Okay. At, uh, in the alternative district the, for bad kids. I used to teach at a school called CLC, called Criminal's Last Chance. That's okay. what they called it. <laughs> and and that's, that was, that's what the teachers called it. It was CLC, Contemporary Learning Center. But teachers on the quiet used to call it Criminal's Last Chance. That's a horrible name. <laughs> because the kids, the kids used to come to school after court, before court, high. One little guy I know, real, real smart guy. He in gym class. He walking around gym class, walking around the track, smoking weed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what he's doing. Good guy, you know, but, but, you know smart guys. I mean, but guys just didn't have, they had never, like, known a, a black man. Yeah. So they, they, they used to, like, hang around my room after school. And at one point, I was teaching at uh, Wallop Prep Academy, which is an all-black male school on TSU's campus. And I had a group of young men, it's all, all, guys, all, it's all boys school. I had a group of young men. I used to ha have a class on Friday afternoon at three o'clock in history. I was teaching uh, Texas history, American history, and world history. Mm. And on a Friday after school, I'd have 30 kids in the room. So I knew they had the hunger, but they, did, they, did, they, didn't, they had, didn't have the motivation. The motivation, and that, that's possibly uh, a time that you've seen how just your appearance and, and your energy and the visual sight of you was so unique that those kids had to come back and see. It probably wasn't even the fact that you were giving them something that was nourishment to their brain. But it could have been something as simple as uh, curiosity. Wanting to know how a person with our color Wanted to know how a person with our background possibly could be so in control, so straightforward, and hold himself in a higher standard than what they had ever seen. Here's how I usually look when I'm taking pictures with senators and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> of course you do. That's I mean, the that's the best what way I, to look. That's, that's, of course you do. I, I kept that. saying I needed my shades the whole way up here. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> You and should have had them. Like, got my <laughs> But then, you know, they're going to say, oh, you too flat boy, man. You don't go in there. They already cussing me out because I got gold teeth and I wear my own clothes. Man. You know, they don't want me to wear this stuff. You look, man, you got kill on there. Who you didn't kill? Uh, you didn't kill nobody. Like, y'all don't kill everybody. I ain't kill nobody. Y'all killed them before I got here. <laughs> and then you have a host of sunglasses, huh? Yeah. I thought right would have warned you, man. Well, you know. It's all right. My eyes is good. I'm still young, so I'm all right. Oh yeah, oh yeah, for sure. Now, you, who's your who's your counsel for? Who, Y'all retain the lawyer for this? Uh, right now, we have a, a civil lawyer, uh, okay. Robert Ranko. 
uh, he helped out with the Larry Jackson okay. and uh, Adam Lowry firm when they got him uh, uh, situated. I hope he doesn't get mad at me because lawyers can be kind of possessed when it comes to their clients. I mean, you know, lawyers are lawyers. They here in place. I know I've been one for 40 years. Well, you know, I like <laughs> I know lawyers. I think that I, I think that you know it's something that I had overlooked growing up because I grew up in the '80s, and in the '80s, black men, if you last, if you live through that uh, genocide of of AIDS, crack cocaine, and gang banging, if you made it through that, which are all separate genocides, we were raised to be so strong physically, and that was the most thing pushed on us. Mm -hmm. To be like Bo Jackson, to be like Michael Jordan or Wayne Gretzky, and we wasn't applauded for the smartness. We we literally dumbed ourselves down to fit in for almost uh -huh. five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years possibly, just because we wanted to be cool. And that era, it was cool to be strong. At some point in time after that, we lost the sight of the Mr. T's we mm -hmm. got used to seeing on TV with all the gold chains and loud and, and he's strong. And we went to the Tyler Perry's. So we got distracted. We got distracted. We said it was okay to laugh. You see what I'm saying? Because we were tired I'm of so crying. Quiet. <laughs> and, and, and now we're back placed in that same dilemma and you got all these people crying. They say, please, give us somebody to laugh at. So we're going to get the darkest man, the tallest man, and we're going to dress him up as a woman. And we want y'all to stop crying today. We want y'all to look at this black man. We're going to put a wig on him. We're going to put a curly hair wig on him. We're going to dress him up in a dress. We're going to put some stockings on him. We're going to give him big bean bags and put him on his chest. And we're going to set him out here so you can laugh at him because we're tired of y'all crying. We're tired of y'all whining. We're tired of y'all saying, fix this, fix that. Give us this back. Give us this back. Why y'all say we lazy? We made this. Since they tired of hearing those words, they'd rather get the meanest, biggest, strongest black man and dress him up as a woman so that you can laugh and you can stop crying. That's where we at today. Okay. Fatima, yes, how did you come to work with Austin Justice Coalition? Um, Chaz and I met at a, a march. Because he's from Houston. Yeah, he, we met here. So we met, you met, a, met here? Yeah, we met in Austin at a march, at the Larry, Larry Jackson March in front of APD, actually, uh, three years ago in, in February. And he spoke, I spoke, and we hit it off. It was awesome. Like, we, um, he wanted, we realized in order to make a difference, we had to have an organization. So he coming from, like he came from Houston. He right. had experience with the Houston Justice Coalition. Mm -hmm. And so we started the Austin Justice Coalition. Um, and then we did marches. We worked on um, police body wearing camera mm -hmm. policies together. I'm actually in law school, so I'm a second year. Where, at UT? Absolutely not. I go to Southern University of Austin in Baton Rouge. <laughs> I go to an HBCU. You, you may know you may know Judge Fred Tinsley out of Dallas. He was uh, Southern. Southern. Which my law my law school my law my law school made uh, Foster Reese went to undergrad at Southern yeah. Engineering School. Yeah, I'm, I'm an HBCU girl. Um, so that happened, and then I realized uh, working with Chaz, there was just an, uh, a miss in the community in, in terms of having black women at the table for policy, um, bringing resources to the hood. I just really believe that there's so many resources in here, Austin, but we don't bring them to the people that need them. We ask the people that need them to come to the resources, and I think that's just asinine. So um, we created Counterbalance ATX, Christina mm -hmm. Brown and I, and we combat systems and not people. Mm -hmm. So we do everything from law informational sessions, so teach it, like we get lawyers to come out to tell people when you need an attorney, what questions you should ask an attorney. Mm -hmm. um, we did a fetal barrio where we got fresh food donated out from Urban Roots to Elmridge. So that's the community that we work with. So we just, you know, do what we can, how we can, okay. the way we can. And this uh, AJC has been around, what, 10 years? Is no, that 10 years? No, how long? No, since February 2014. 2014? Mm -hmm. And Counterbalance started last year. So we started that last year. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm working all the way up. Yeah, so um, I found out about the story, and I just, how do I help? Like, mm. you know, you, I just work the way I wish somebody would if it was me. So if that was me laying up there, I would want somebody to make sure my story was told. Uh -huh. If it was my brother, I would, like, I have a brother. I would be out here doing the same exact thing he's doing. Um, I'd probably be raising a little bit more hell because I'm a woman and I'm only 30. <laughs> um, so um, he's, like, Clarence has been doing an amazing job. Like, he's, uh, you know, it's never easy kind of mourning 
um, and trying to fight for justice at the same time. So yeah. it's just being able to say like how can we help? And it's been really awesome for a lot of organizations to come together and figure out like how can we just you know be and make sure that the story is told because we all know the victors tell the story, uh -huh. and the victors right now are APD. So yeah. the fact that there isn't any cameras and they all have dash cams on their car, but there was over three officers out there and no, there's no footage. No, no um, footage at all. None. Um, the fact that the DA and they, and they all have cam body cameras. No, not body cameras in their car. What? Dash cams. Dash cams. Yes. So the officers were outside. They weren't in his house. He, they were shot into the house. So if they, they shot into the house. Mm -hmm. So if there's if there's cameras on the car, then why isn't there footage of anything? Not you rolling up. Like what happened? Yeah. There's nothing. Um, and then you know, Margaret Moore just released that there's she's gonna have the civil rights division, and they're supposed to be collecting evidence, and the evidence is supposed to be given to the family, and then they're gonna figure out if they're going to actually bring it in front of the special grand jury. I'm trying to figure out why we haven't heard from Margaret Moore. Where like why hasn't the family heard from her? Yeah. Where's the evidence that they're collecting? Yeah, why everybody feel like they can basically put this case together, get the fame off the case. Uh, get the attention they want for their own careers out the case and never acknowledge the family. Never acknowledge the people who have to live with the tragedy. Never acknowledge the people who have to wake up day in and day out and talk to the children. Why do we constantly have a society on both sides, high and low, continuously overlook what's important? And that's our children. And it don't matter what side you're on, you can be a Democratic or a Republican. But if I get to your household and your kids tell you I don't feel like listening to him because all he do is work, and I go back to the slums, mm -hmm. and I go down there, and this woman working two, three jobs to take care of these two kids, and her son telling her the same thing, I don't want to listen up because all she do is work. There's two different economies. It's two different pay raise, and it's two different tax rackets. But you're hearing the same song. You're hearing the same voice and you're hearing the same person, that little bitty baby in the middle, which is what life is all about. Mm -hmm. We continue to do what we do. We continue to politic. We continue to look for the law. We continue to look for the justice and we overlook the child. We overlook the future. We overlook the change. We overlook the new beginning. You want a new beginning? Quit worrying about these old folks. Mm -hmm. And start <clears throat> looking for what is a new beginning. What resembles a new beginning? That's our children. Now this uh, this is an interesting show to me because I didn't I had no idea what the world was going to happen, but something just moved me to. I'm telling you, it's Clifford and Chaz and Robert. Something about like two years ago, I didn't know any of these guys, but now because we're all concerned about what's good for the community. That's what we try to do. Any way I try, to, any way I can help, I try to. And and and, and, like, and to me, this show, I've got some conservative friends, of course. Yeah. And, I, and what, what I always urge them: we have to show that we care. Sometimes people don't know you care until you show it. True. You yeah. can't you can't stay over there and they over here and and some idiot in the middle talking about you and you're not saying anything, and they they think you got horns and you don't say anything. Well, you just not say anything. Open your mouth. They're taking your money, using it against you, and, and pimping. That's what they're doing, is pimping. That's the way I see it. I think we get caught up in labels, right? So I think. Yeah, some people the, don't like labels. The, the I biggest, understand that. I think the biggest thing is the humanity in it all. And I think that, um, unfortunately, Austin, APD, uh, government agencies, people forget to treat other people as humans. And, and that's the biggest issue. And I think with me and L, like LP, is he's a human and he's, he's someone's father, he's someone's mm -hmm. son, he's someone's brother. And we don't always talk about that. We talk about, well, my party believes this and my party believes that, or my religion or my God believes this. But if, if you are really speaking from the humanity part, then it's being able to say that no one deserves to be shot nine times right. and treated the way that LP has been treated. Mm -hmm. um, and no one deserves to be body slammed no one deserves like the, the justice system was created for just that you're supposed to you know call the police they're supposed to arrest you and then you're supposed to be mm -hmm. arraigned and you're supposed to get your day in court Have a trial that's, that's how it's, that's how it was created all, all that good stuff that's what's supposed to happen but when you look like us in this country 
It don't matter if you're a man or a woman. Yeah. Your life don't yeah. matter. It's, it's either you can you can get bullets in your house and you said something amazing earlier. They didn't know who was in that house. The police officer. That's why. No that's idea. why I asked who was in the house. They didn't know who was in who was in the house. And and, and to, to to elaborate on that, the humane the the inhumane thing that's going on is you take a guy that's been shot with a shotgun, assault rifle, a Glock. You take the buck shots, you take the bullets around about this big from that assault rifle, and then you take those those bullets that that that's in that nine, that clock. And all these bullets were created to go through you. Go through the body and explode. So all the holes that's in his back, they started off small. Mm -hmm. But in the front, they all got big holes in them like golf balls. And you put three over here. You put three more back here. You put one in each hand, and then you put one in your face. Now you take that man, you put him in a hospital, you lay him down on the bed, you put him through two or three surgeries, you keep him sedated so he can't get up and talk. Every time he looks up, he can't see nobody there for him. He don't know if he's alive or dead. The people that he love, ain't they, they, he can't see them. Mm -hmm. he, he, he gasping for breath, he gasping for breath. He gets up, he sees somebody, he does know. He sees his mother and then he goes back mm -hmm. to sleep. And then you take him out of that situation and you place him in a cell. And you put him on, 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 on iron and you lay him down on there. He's not receiving the right medical uh, uh, there in Dale Valley. He's in Dale Valley Jail. They ain't wait a whole seven days to take this man who been shot with three or four different guns and type of guns with all these assault rifles and shotguns, and they take him out of a bed that's in the hospital and they put him in a cell. And they don't put him in the infirmary or the medical part of the jail. They don't put him somewhere where it's sterilized and it's clean, but they take him and they move all the other inmates and say, hey, you go over this mm -hmm. wing, you go over this wing. We're going to keep this one wing for him because he got a high profile case. Okay, I got, I got 30 seconds to wind up, but I want to thank you guys for coming to my show, for real. I wish I had talked to I'm you last me. night and when, when, you first, when you first called, but I had something, something, you prayed too hard and I had to try to make something, <laughs> I had to try to make something happen. I want to thank Rob Muhammad and, and Clifford and uh, Chaz again for helping me get, helping me get you guys down here. And thank you for coming very much, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, sir. We're going to change this thing. Get something right.